Check out trainertests.com for next generation VCP prep exams that include this and many other videos. In this video, I'll explain the vSphere CPU scheduler in vSphere 6, and we'll cover some key terms and concepts. Terms like a world. What is a world? A world is a thread of execution that's running on the ESXi host. For example, one world may be a virtual CPU for a virtual machine, or the mouse, keyboard, and screen for a virtual machine is another world. Or the virtual machine monitor is another world as well. So a virtual machine is actually made up of multiple threads of execution or multiple worlds. There are also worlds that aren't related to virtual machines as well. Another term you need to be familiar with is symmetric multiprocessor or SMP. That simply refers to the virtual machines that are created using multiple virtual CPUs. SMP allows a virtual machine to access more than one virtual CPU at once. We can use CPU affinity to force a virtual machine to use a specific physical processor on the ESXi host. And we can also use some command line tools like ESX top to analyze the performance of our ESXi host and to quickly identify CPU performance issues. So let's take a look at a diagram that will illustrate how the CPU scheduler works. In this case, we have multiple virtual machines and they're all gonna be sharing a common set of processors on the ESXi host. So here, for example, we start up a virtual machine with two virtual CPUs. And as that virtual machine is running, it's going to utilize two processor cores on the ESXi host. If I then boot up another virtual machine, this time with four virtual CPUs, it's going to use four processor cores on the ESXi host. And sometimes it might be using the same processor cores that that first virtual machine was using. And as I create more and more virtual machines, the ESXi host will tie those virtual machines to specific processors. Now this is fluid. It can change. If once, <clears throat> rephrase. Now this is fluid and it can change. For example, if the ESXi host realizes that one particular CPU socket is becoming overwhelmed, it will migrate virtual machines around to equalize that workload. This is CPU load balancing. So in this scenario, we see virtual machine with, <clears throat> rephrase. This is CPU load balancing. So in this situation, we see one virtual machine with two virtual CPUs, and then there's another virtual machine with one virtual CPU, and they're sharing a processor core. Now, if that processor core starts to get overwhelmed and there's just too much work happening on it, the ESXi host will dynamically move virtual machines around from one processor to another to equalize that workload. How about hyperthreading? What is the impact of hyperthreading on my virtual machine performance? Well, on the left side, we see two virtual machines on a non-hyperthreaded host. On the right side, we see two virtual machines that are on a hyperthreaded host. So let's take a look at what happens when we enable hyperthreading. The two virtual machines on the left have something that they need the processor to execute. Notice those little black circles. Those are instructions that the virtual machine needs carried out on a physical processor. So on a non hyper threaded processor, those instructions are sent one by one. The processor completes an instruction, then it's ready to receive the next instruction. So the virtual machines are taking turns sending those instructions to the processor. On the right hand side, we have a hyper threaded processor. So those virtual machines are able to send those instructions to the processor on their own thread. They can send their instructions simultaneously. This gets the instructions to the processor faster. And if you'll notice, the moment that that CPU finishes the first instruction, 
it doesn't have to wait for another instruction to come from some other VM, right? The next instruction is already there and the CPU can immediately move on and execute it. That's the purpose of hyperthreading. It's essentially a scheduling enhancement that allows multiple VMs to send instructions to the processor at once. And that way, as soon as that process is done, completing some instruction, it can immediately move on to the next instruction without waiting for a virtual machine to send it. Now that we've covered the basics of the vSphere CPU scheduler, let's look a little bit at how it shares these processor resources through a method called co-scheduling. And in this first slide, we're going to look at something called strict co-scheduling. Now, this is a little bit older. This is kind of old school. This isn't the way that the ESXi host really works anymore, but it's good to have an understanding of this before we move on to the more complex, relaxed co-scheduling. Right? It's important to understand the limitations that strict co-scheduling had. So let's walk through this. Here we have two virtual machines and they're running on an ESXi host with a single socket quad core CPU. And so the virtual machine on the left has four virtual CPUs. So when it needs to carry out some sort of instruction on the processors, it's going to try to simultaneously use four processor cores because it has four virtual CPUs. Now, what does this mean for the virtual machine on the right? Well, at that moment, the virtual machine with four virtual CPUs is using all of the processor cores. So if the virtual machine on the right wants to execute something, it has to wait until the next time slot. And when that time slot arrives, my virtual machine with two virtual CPUs consumes two of those processor cores. Well, that means for that time slot, two processor cores are gone. And the virtual machine on the left needs four in order to operate. So if it still has things that it needs to get done, if it still has instructions that need to get executed, it's going to have to wait until the next time slot. And the pattern repeats itself. And we end up with cores that for certain time slots are actually being wasted. The other side effect is I have two virtual machines that are taking turns. They are not able to simultaneously execute on these shared processor cores. They're taking turns. And this results in higher CPU ready values. So what do I mean by CPU ready time? Well, CPU ready time is the amount of time that a virtual machine is ready to execute but it cannot access a physical processor. So higher ready times is bad. And that's one of the results of this sort of configuration where we've created a virtual machine with four virtual CPUs. Maybe we could actually bring it down to two virtual CPUs and then they would be able to run at the same time. And we wouldn't have these co-scheduling issues and we wouldn't have these higher CPU ready values. So it's very important to properly size your virtual machines, right? And the rule is give your VMs the resources that they need and no more. Don't give your virtual machines resources that they don't need. Because if you do, you're simply going to end up wasting resources. And in this scenario, the virtual machine on the left with four virtual CPUs, it may actually run faster if we scale it back to two virtual CPUs because then both virtual machines can execute simultaneously and they'll never be sitting around waiting for physical processor cores. Now we're going to take a look at relaxed co-scheduling in just a moment. And as we drill into these concepts here, uh, you may be thinking, man, how am I going to remember all this for the VCP exam? The key is to understand these concepts and learn them over and over again. And there's some great practice exams at www.trainertests.com that can help. So at the end of this course, I'll have some details on how you can find these outstanding practice exams. 
Okay, back to our CPU scheduler. Now let's take a look at relaxed co-scheduling and how it differs from strict co-scheduling. The CPU scheduler in vSphere 5 or later incorporates relaxed co-scheduling and this can help maximize the efficiency of your physical CPUs. So on the left, we again see our four virtual CPU virtual machine. And on the right, we have our two virtual CPU virtual machine. And now when my virtual machine wants to execute and it's got four virtual CPUs, it's still going to try to use four processor cores. So let's just assume in that first time slot, it's not really competing with anything else it gets all four processor cores on that first time slot. But in the second time slot, my two vCPU virtual machine also wants access to a processor. Now, if you remember in our last diagram, on cores one and two, we essentially had some stranded time slots. We had time slots that were wasted. That's not the case with relaxed co-scheduling. What's going to happen is, my four vCPU VM is going to be able to utilize two processor cores. This is why they call it relaxed co-scheduling. A four vCPU virtual machine doesn't necessarily need to wait for four available processor cores. It can continue to make progress even when it can't get the full number of processors available to it. And so as time goes on, these two virtual machines aren't taking turns, right? They're operating at the same time. They're not waiting around for each other and creating these higher CPU ready values. So relaxed co-scheduling really resolves a lot of the problems that come from overbuilt virtual machines, virtual machines with too many virtual CPUs. It definitely helps but it's not a complete fix. It's still really important to right size your virtual machines. Well, why is that? Because relaxed, <clears throat> rephrase, because relaxed co-scheduling introduces the possibility of something called CPU skew. When you configure a virtual machine with multiple virtual CPUs, the operating system on that virtual machine doesn't know what's going on in the background. It doesn't know that it's a virtual machine. It thinks I have dedicated physical processors. And so the guest operating system may kick off multiple related processes. And the operating system expects these processes to be executed simultaneously. The host uses something called co-scheduling to make this happen. It will schedule those processes to take place on multiple virtual CPUs at the same time. So for example, I have a virtual machine with four virtual CPUs, vCPU one, vCPU two, three, and four. And the guest operating system kicks off some process that's utilizing all four of those virtual CPUs. Now on the ESXi host itself, that VM may be able to get access to four processor cores, or it might only be able to get access to two processor cores during some time slots or one processor core. And what's happening in the guest operating system at this point is two of the processors are making progress and two of them are not. Maybe two of these vCPUs are making significantly more progress than the others because they're getting access to their physical cores more regularly. This is unacceptable to the guest operating system once this skew reaches a certain threshold. And so what the ESXi host will do, what the CPU scheduler will do, is as vCPU1 and vCPU2 get further and further ahead, the CPU scheduler will start to slow them down. It'll use something called co-stop to reduce the speed of those virtual CPUs. You can learn more about all of these concepts at www.trainertests.com. This video and many others are embedded right into those practice exams. 
so that as you answer questions about these topics, you can immediately learn about the concepts. There's free demos, there's a 100% money back guarantee if you're not satisfied, and over 170 questions written that align to the VCP6 Data Center Virtualization Exam Blueprint. And as you finish your exam, you'll get a report that will tie back your score to each of the individual exam blueprint areas so that you know exactly which areas you're strong on and which areas you need to study more. I hope you'll check out these great practice exams and they're an excellent tool to help you prepare for the VCP.